a residential drug rehab center. Who else in here uses pot a lot? Here, teenage addicts try to regain control over their lives that have been captured by addiction. After a while, it was like, instead of me having the control over the drugs, it was like the drugs had control over me. If I was sick, I was thinking about dope. If I was on dope, I was thinking about how I'm gonna get it again. And like, that's all I thought about all the time. One day I was sober, I didn't have anything to drink and nothing to smoke. And I realized it was the first day in a long time that I had no chemicals in my body. And it felt weird and I was irritated. And it was, it was the worst day of my life. You know, I've been here about a week now. I'm still not recovered. I still, every single day, want to smoke. And it's been a part of my life for so long. You know, Addiction I, used I to be viewed as simply a moral failing, so a weakness of character. I just love it so much. But scientists have begun to investigate how addictive substances fundamentally change the brain, gradually taking control over motivation and desire. Addiction research has focused on the neural circuitry in the brain's reward pathway, the network of neurons where our desires arise. Flowing along this network, continuously stimulating our pleasures and appetites, are the neurotransmitters that one neuron uses to talk to another. Addictive drugs work by altering the level of these neurotransmitters and slyly capturing the reward pathway. All addictive drugs are Trojan horses. Every single one of the chemicals that are addictive are mimics. That is, they look like a neurotransmitter. They look like one of the chemicals that the brain uses for nerve cells to communicate with one another. Many addictive drugs mimic one of the most powerful neurotransmitters in the reward pathway, dopamine. In the normal brain, dopamine travels across the synapse, stimulates receptors on the target neuron, and then it is quickly reabsorbed by tiny molecular vacuum cleaners called dopamine transporters. But when cocaine is abused, trillions of cocaine molecules surge into the synapses clogging the vacuum cleaners, artificially boosting the level of dopamine in the brain, producing a cocaine high. Let's imagine a wonderful natural reward. You know, I go to a restaurant and have the best ice cream sundae I've ever had. You know, I'd have a certain amount of dopamine probably being released in my brain. But cocaine, which gets there chemically, gives your brain, gives these synapses more dopamine for a longer amount of time than it has ever experienced before. Now with the experience of your first drug high, particularly when it's cocaine and heroin, watch what happens. The dopamine levels ascend above and beyond those experienced with orgasm. Above and beyond the greatest physiologic experience we can have as men and women. I got so high, and I literally thought I was floating. I was just, you know, da da da, you know, going through, you know, you know, bumping into people and ha making jokes and laughing, and tears were rolling down my face. I was laughing so hard, and after doing like three or four, I just kind of sit back and light a cigarette, and it would just like fill me, like completely, and like it was like taking me away from the world. Once the drugs and the alcohol are introduced into the addicted brain, the natural system is what we call down-regulated. It means that the things that are supposed to work for exercise and food and all the things that are supposed to make us feel good, they basically go into hibernation. You have a feeling of hopelessness such that the only thing you can possibly do to have any semblance of pleasure in your life is to re-administer the drug. The first high can be exhilarating, but after repeated drug abuse, a dark side to addiction begins to take its toll. The brain responds to the repeated use of cocaine and the dopamine surging in the synapse by fighting back, cutting away receptors on the neuron that are the dopamine's target. Without the receptors, dopamine can't stimulate the neuron, and the drug high is reduced. 
but so is enjoyment of all normal pleasures as well. It tricks my brain, you know? Uh, it made me think that, you know, that I was happy that I enjoyed my life when in fact I really didn't. When I wasn't high, I hated my life. I remember writing diary entries, like I was in pain, but I still want to do more and I can't stop. And I just wanted to die all the time. I didn't even want to live anymore. You know, none of these kids sat down and said, hey, I want to be a drug addict. Actually, what happened is, uh, like lots of other adolescents, they played what turned out for them to be a game of Russian roulette. There was something about their genes, something about their temperament that made them vulnerable so that when other kids got away, often scot-free, they got hooked. There was something different about their brains. We've got some alcohol in here, and our job now is to help you to consume this beverage in about a 10-minute period. Like so, cocaine, uh, alcohol is dangerously addictive. Can, By their alcohol, senior year in high school, so nine and a half million American teenagers will have tried it. So, you've been watching the sports? At the San Diego uh, Veterans Hospital, Mark Shuckett is trying to understand what makes some of these teenagers more vulnerable to alcohol than others. Oh, yeah, sure. Super. That's great. For volunteers like 18-year-old Justin and 21-year-old Elika, Shuckett collapses one night of drinking into 10 minutes and then records the way their brains respond. Alcohol has a huge impact on brain waves, and it is indeed one of the ways that one can measure how the brain is changing in the presence of alcohol or other drugs. We gave them equivalent amounts of alcohol per kilogram. The result of that was that their blood alcohol levels were virtually identical. What the brain waves show us is that Elika is responding more to the alcohol than Justin. Her brain waves are being impacted by the alcohol significantly more than Justin's brain waves are being affected. So on a zero to 36 scale, how high do you feel? 36. What do you think about the slurredness of your speech? Are you, is your speech slurred? Mm, I don't think so, but it prob probably is. It's probably like a 20. Okay. And regarding how drunk or intoxicated you feel overall? 36. And she was that. having difficulty mm -hmm. concentrating, was having problems focusing on exactly what it was that we were talking about. And she had some pretty darn good insight that she was feeling pretty high. And on a 0 to 36 scale, how high, using that term generically, feeling in, high or intoxicated are you? Nothing. I don't feel anything really, like okay. maybe a one. And how about how clumsy you feel you might be? Nah, zero. And um, problems where you feel like you're floating? <laughs> zero. Got it. Justin had the same blood alcohol level, and when we asked him how he felt, he was basically saying, I don't feel much. It was almost close to zero, very low on the scale. And all you had to do was look at him, and you knew that he was feeling less. Zero. The same blood alcohol level, Having very different blood reactions. Blood the <laughs> Zero. The two people are starting out their drinking evenings with basically different equipment on board. Elika, after one or two drinks, is likely to look around and say, I'm getting pretty high, I'd better slow down. And a zero to 30 Justin, scale, how we would guess, when he goes to a party, zero. just having a couple of drinks, he probably looks around and says, well, what's the big deal? And he's probably more likely to go on to three, four, or five. Yeah, zero on that. Justin gets deal? drunk. It just takes Justin a lot more alcohol to get drunk than Elika. Even though Justin's brain responds more slowly to alcohol, he is more likely than Elika to become an alcoholic. Because he is less aware of alcohol's powerful effect, he may keep drinking when Elika might stop, exposing his brain to ever higher levels of alcohol and increasing the chance that he will become addicted. You know, I've talked to kids my age, my size, six beers and they're passed out. For me, six beers, I'm just starting to get warmed up. I can drink easily almost a case of beer to myself. 
you know, I have alcoholism in the family, you know, going back generations, and I'm sure that plays a major role.